what I want us to be thinking about today is we're going to be thinking about what it means to lead other people who are human. What does our understanding of humanness mean about the way that we lead other people? Um, uh, uh, particularly thinking about what, what that means about the leadership of teams and groups of people. If you can summarize, I think what we've seen in the past couple of days, you could summarize it as recognizing I am not God. That at one level is the, the kind of thing, the essence of understanding what it means to be human in relation to leadership. I am not God. Um, if you want to say what we're really going to sort of think about today, and the other side of that is other people are not God either. And it's kind of holding those two things together. I'm not God. Other people are not God. Inevitably, um, very much more of your work involves leading and working with other people. I don't know if you've experienced this. I've experienced this as a church member, a church worker, a church leader, and now a denominational leader. The further, the more senior my leadership gets, the less it's about what I do and the more it's about what other people do. I think often when you start out in ministry, it's all about using your gifts to achieve certain functions. It's very about you and what you achieve and what you accomplish. And as you become a more senior leader, you have to transition to it being about other people, not about you. So at a more junior level, I think, um, often um, you are doing ministry yourself. At a more senior level, essentially you're enabling others to do ministry. And that is a fundamental shift. And I think in doing that, it's helpful to think about what it means to be human. An observation, I think it's worth noting that almost everything we've said about the problems of leadership of other people is basically a description of what it means to be a parent. <laughs> I don't know if you noticed that, but just about everything you've described is actually a res uh, what it's actually like to parent kind of um, others. So therefore, it's not that surprising that the New Testament criteria for leadership and elders in Timothy and Titus talk about able to manage your family well. I just think it's interesting that that's kind of an overlap there of what we got. Um, let me tell you what I find most frustrating about leading other people. It touches on some of your things. My most frustrating thing is they can't read my mind. <laughs> Um, actually, what I really want is to sit there and for them to fully understand what I'm thinking and why, um, rather than to have to base it on my communication. Um, I really, really want to lead with a group of people who instinctively know what I'm thinking. Well, uh, most of the time. Okay. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean, though. Um, Okay, well, that, that's right. Let, let me provide a little bit of um, framework for that as we think about how this works out. We've been thinking about what it means to be fully human, made in the um, image of God. And I think um, uh, these are, are really probably the seven top things that flow from that. This is a summary of what we've seen. Um, remembering that we're made in the image of God is a reminder, too, as we're created. Um, and that's a reminder, too, as we're limited. And I think it's really important to grasp our limits are not the result of the fall. We were actually created limited. It's not a problem of the fall. We are limited in our knowledge, our physical location, our physical ability. You know, we are, by definition, limited and finite. There's only so much we can uh, kind of do. Um, it's important to grasp that. I am just a creature. We've been commissioned by which I mean God has given us a mission. We were created for a purpose. Now, um, in the Genesis account, as we've seen, that purpose is um, to be God's representative rulers, to bring his work and his world to fruitfulness. That's what I think it means, fill and subdue. Uh, Adam, and he, Adam was created, man was created to fill and subdue the world. Um, actually, that's what we do in creation, but it's also what we do in the kind of the Great Commission. That's the work of the kingdom. Our work is ultimately to fill creation with the people of God and to bring it to fruitfulness. 
um, filling and subduing, bringing it under the good rule of God. Thirdly, we were designed for relationship. It's intrinsic to our nature that we are meant to be in relationship with others. We are not um, isolated individuals. And our relationships are to be both vertical and horizontal, in relationship with God and in relationship with other people. It's of our very nature to be um, relational. Those are all part of original good creation. And you have to layer over that. On top of that, we are now fallen because of rebellion uh, against God. We are under sin. We have become corrupt. So we're morally flawed. We're sinful. We have to battle to be what we should be. It doesn't come naturally. Life is a constant struggle against the desires of the fallen flesh. So we might know what we're meant to be, but actually it's a struggle to even be it. Um, uh, And we're fallen. The great news, of course, for us as Christians is we're redeemed. Actually, uh, uh, sort of um, God in his mercy has rescued us. Um, He's regenerated us and made us new creations. He's um, freed us from the power of sin. And he's remaking it to be what we should be. That's the great news. But it's a work in progress. So we are not there um, yet. But um, uh, we uh, are able to be transformed and changed and fulfill our mission. And then um, lastly, um, actually as human beings, we are mortal and we long for eternity. In other words, there's a sense in which we will never be satisfied here. Frustration is part and parcel of being a human being. And I think that's crucial for us to grasp as leaders. You will never save the world. There is no utopia that you can achieve. We're always working towards the new creation, but we actually can't fully enjoy it and experience it. In the end, all of us, no matter how successful our ministries might be at the moment, no matter how healthy we might be at the moment, in the end, we're going to retire and die. Um, And we will not have kind of changed the world ourselves. We need to see ourselves fitting in in that big picture. So I, I think those are the kind of fundamental principles that flow from what it means to be human. And we're thinking about those, how those cash out in, in leadership. Well, let's move on from those foundations to think about um, working with others. Um, you mentioned the danger that others have an expectation of us as being more than human. I think one of our problems is we can have an expectation of others as being more than human. We, we actually, the way they treat us is actually the way that we treat other people because we don't remember that they are are human beings. Um, And so um, my my key thing here is why does does our humanity necessitate that that we work in teams and organizations, that we have to work with others? And I want, uh, yeah, indeed, I I would say our humanity demands that because God has created us to accomplish his mission only together. That's of of the very essence of what it means to be human. The mission God has given us can only be accomplished by working together. Basically, we are designed not to work as individuals, but essentially to be organized. And uh, you may not like the word organization. The word organization sounds very formal and legalistic. Um, uh, Maybe it's better to think in terms of we need to be organized to be able to work together. And that can be in a very informal, relational group or network. Or it can be in a quite structured organization. In a way, a friendship group is is organized. A family is organized. A company is organized. There's different levels of formality, but basically the principle is still the same. People in some way being organized together to accomplish um, a common uh, purpose um, or mission. And that's how God 
has designed us to do his work. And I think we need to be rescued um, as leaders from a cult of individualism. I think that's the great danger that we fall into, or the default we can fall into, is an individualism that kind of thinks, I do the mission. Uh, and that's the danger of essentially a Messiah complex. There, the Messiah does do the mission, but we don't. It's, again, forgetting who we are. Um, and actually, we are not designed to be individuals who do um, at the mission. How does that cash out in teams and organizations? Well, if you have a leader who has a Messiah complex, then in the end, for that leader, the organization exists for them. You've got a leader who's got a, 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 a sort of a Messiah complex. They're the one who does the mission, and the organization basically exists to enable them to do it. They will always be using the organization to accomplish their purpose. Does that make sense? Recognize that? If you fully grasp that we're not meant to sort of um, work as individuals, but to work together as a group on the mission, then the, the leader will see the organization is the way to accomplish the mission. And they will exist for the, the mission and the organization. I, that's absolutely crucial difference. Does the organization exist for them? Or does the organization, or do they exist to enable the organization to do the mission? Um, actually, the people who generally fall into that first error are often the pioneer founders. Pioneer founders have a tendency that because they have done it themselves, as, as the work grows, they simply bring in more people to help them do more. Uh, and actually, they find it very difficult to shift from that mindset of the organization exists for me to move to um, I exist to work through the organization. Uh, that makes me slightly nervous. Sorry, this is a side, but that makes me slightly nervous of all kinds of ministries that are named after individuals. If a ministry is named after a person, very often it seems to me that it, it, that just instinctively creates the idea that the person is the key thing and the organization is existing for, for them. That always make, it doesn't inevitably mean they're a messiah complex person, but it always just a warning light to me of ministries built on kind of just names of individuals um, uh, and how that works. So that, that's the, um, the big um, picture. And as I said, I think biblically this is the norm. This is the way the work is meant to be done. Um, if we kind of take what you might call the most developed way this is spoken of in the Bible, it seems to me that the paradigm is the pattern of the body in 1 Corinthians 12 to 14. That is a paradigm of how the work is to be done. What's being said there is the mission of the church, the mission that has been given to the church, um, needs to be undertaken by the body as a whole. The uh, church is a body. It needs to be organized in order to accomplish the mission. And actually, the key point of 1 Corinthians 12 to 14 is for the work to be done, um, all of the parts of the body need to work together, and they're all needed. Um, the primary rebukes of 1 Corinthians 12 to 14, whatever you might think about all the different gifts and what it says there, the primary rebukes are to people who say of some others, they're not needed. So kind of parts of the body saying, actually, we're the really important bit. Everything else isn't necessary. If only everything were an ear, the body would be fantastic. The rest of you, we don't need you. Uh, and then the other side of the coin of that is, is people within the body who feel they're not needed. So because I'm not a, I'm not part of the body. Actually, what, what Paul um, kind of uh, speaks of in 1 Corinthians 12 to 14 is um, a, a kind of a glorious working together of all the parts, all of which are needed in order for the mission to be accomplished. 
uh, basically, he's, he's wanting to encourage the church to work uh, in um, that way. So it, it involves unity, diversity, humility, acceptance of others, in order to create this functioning body. And the point is, the body does the mission, not individual parts of the body. The mission is only accomplished by, um, uh, by uh, the whole. Now, I, I think that's reminding us, right from the, the, the beginning, and it flows from this idea of humanity, that we must kind of work together. That organizations, teams, cooperation, are the way that God's work is accomplished. It flows from the fact of our finitude means that we need each other. None of us is complete or perfect. No matter how much we might be able to do individually, we cannot do the job um, ourselves. It means that no individual has all the gifts. It's actually the point of 1 Corinthians 12 to 14. There are all these different gifts. Um, actually, Paul says that the Holy Spirit has given gifts to everyone as he's distributed them. Those gifts include ministry, they include practicality, they include service, they include leading. But we mustn't make the mistake that what's being said is that the gifts will all be given to any individual. Uh, we, we get used in leadership to the idea of omnicompetent leaders who have all the gifts. And we only think that because leaders are generally more gifted than others. But we mustn't mistake that for being omnicompetent and having all the gifts. They're not, God doesn't give gifts in that way. Uh, similarly, um, no individual has all the wisdom to discern God's will. Again, actually, this, this comes earlier in 1 Corinthians. One of the functionings of the body is the task of the body is to discern the mind of Christ. We're given the Holy Spirit and by the Holy Spirit, we are able to discern the mind of Christ and make judgments. In other words, make decisions. Most of leadership is about making decisions. But again, what's really interesting there is that knowing and discerning the mind of Christ is given to the body, not to an individual. It's collectively that the mind of Christ is discerned. Again, I think that's really important for leadership that it's not an individual who is the spokesman for God, who has all the wisdom and will know what the right judgment is um, in any particular situation. So there's the big idea. God's purposes are accomplished by people working together. Um, uh, that is his design um, uh, for it. Um, and I've gone to 1 Corinthians 12 to 14, which is really the end of the story. But actually, I think you can see that all the way through the biblical pi picture. This is a pattern that is all the way there. Um, I think it starts, as um, was said, with the actual Trinity uh, itself. Um, the very nature of God uh, involves this kind of cooperating together. One hesitates to call the Trinity an organization, but there's a sense in which that's partly true. Um, I think um, in the Trinity, I can put it this way theologically, the imminent trinity emphasizes unity. Father, Son, and Spirit who have one nature that is equally shared. The economic trinity highlights diversity. The different role of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit in salvation. And effectively, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit um, have different roles, play different parts, and salvation is accomplished by them working together. So you have that deep blend of unity in the imminent trinity, and you've got diversity in the economic trinity. And I think that sets the pattern for how God's work is done. In other words, the very way he creates us is something of a reflection of himself. Which shouldn't be that surprising, because surely that's what being in the image of God means. We, some, in some way, are reflective um, of, of him. Now, this um, kind of emphasis on working together, um, I think, is uh, seen right at the start in the creation of Adam and Eve. 
And again, that highlights the need to work together in cooperation. In Genesis 2, um, God has created a kind of Adam. Adam kind of looks at all the animals. And uh, you know, God is getting him to recognize, Adam, you cannot fulfill God's purpose and mission with any of the animals. You and the hippopotamus, you're not going to be able to fill the earth and subdue it. It's just not going to work. Um, there's actually something else needed here. So God creates Eve. And uh, the creation of Eve, the, the not good to be alone, is not primarily psychological, it's missional. Actually, um, the reason why it's not good to be alone is Adam can't do the job of filling the earth and subduing it just on his own. It needs Adam and Eve. That's why God created male and female in his image. And, and again, there in Adam and Eve, you have both unity and diversity. They're both human, but they are distinct and different. They have slightly different roles to play. But only by working together can the mission be accomplished. And what's the first thing that Adam and Eve do in the beginning of the un sort of unfolding of God's plan? Well, they have children. And uh, of course, that is the ultimate of a working together to accomplish God's purpose. So um, right from there, a pattern is established. Um, the nation of Israel, uh, the story unfolds, it moves from family to the building of nations. Again, in the nation of Israel, the, the, the nation operates as a, as a whole. And the people have all sorts of different roles to play. It requires kings and judges, prophets and priests who are teaching. It requires kind of farmers and soldiers. Um, it requires kind of uh, administrators. The, the, the nation can only operate and fulfill its God-given mission by all of those working together to accomplish the goal. So the mission of Israel is to be a kingdom of priests bringing God's good news to the world. But it can only do that by all of the people playing their part and functioning as unity and diversity. Um, I think we see the same in Jesus. When Jesus comes to fulfill God's mission and be the true Israel, um, uh, he obviously does the work himself. But his whole purpose is, is to kind of reconstitute God's people. He's going to return to be with the Father. So right from the beginning, he recruits a team. And um, his work is going to be done by his group of disciples. And again, you get the sense that his disciples are diverse, they're different. You know, who would bring together the group of people Jesus brought together? The, the kind of the radical zealot and the tax collector, uh, the kind of the nationalist and the kind of um, uh, the collaborator. Um, you know, the sons of thunder and those who seem somewhat quieter. Uh, kind of Peter, the kind of manly, uh, kind of man from the front. Thomas, the kind of diffident, kind of doubter. That there's a diversity there. And the work is done by the team as a whole. And that continues on into the book of Acts. Whereas the gospel grows, um, uh, the work is done by teams that are sent out. And then as churches are established, teams are brought into um, place. Now, you might think that's all blindingly obvious. And I'm, I'm just te teaching grandma to suck eggs. But I really just want us to see that this is absolutely at the very heart of the Bible story and the way mission is done. Because as leaders, I think we can sometimes be a bit frustrated that this is how we have to do it. Sometimes it seems deeply inefficient and ineffective. If only we could just get on with it. But actually, this is God's way of doing things. I think grasping that we are human um, helps us to see that and uh, kind of understand it. So essentially, God's mission is done by organized groups of people working together. Two thoughts which might be helpful. 
I think the first is it, it, we do need to guard ourselves the danger against the danger of becoming unhealthy as leaders. If we are organizational leaders, it is primarily our task to make sure that we in the organization do not become unhealthy. And um, I think something to recognize is that there are temptations of success. There are temptations of weakness and failure, but there are particular temptations of success. Mm -hmm. uh, we see that. To some extent, Mark Driscoll, I think, is a model of that. It was a temptation of success to become proud, sort of um, uh, to become um, self-confident, to begin to think that you are the one who is doing God's work for you and he's very lucky to have you and to have your organization and how pleased he must be with you and, and, and what you're kind of accomplishing. That, that pride takes over. Again, we see that biblically, don't we? You might think of someone like David. David basically goes wrong in his adultery with Bathsheba after he's become successful. There's a sort of a, a, a kind of a, a, a self-regard that then goes with having become successful, an entitlement that leads kind of into kind of sin. So starting well doesn't guarantee keeping going well. I'm always sort of struck by, it's Demas, isn't it, in the New Testament. He um, always loved to be first. We've just got to be watching against that um, uh, kind of all the time. So I think that's one thought. The other thought, which I think you rightly make, is that one of the challenges in leadership um, and organizations is to know when it's right for an organization to finish. It, I, I think you're right. Sort of ministries don't have a right to exist for their own sake. And sometimes the right thing to do for a ministry or organization is to say, it's no longer needed, or it's fulfilled its purpose, or the resources would be better used in a different way. In the same way that an individual church might choose to close, because that particular church is no longer needed or fulfilling its purpose. And that's a really hard thing to do as a leader. But there are moments at which it's right to say, this organization um, oughtn't to continue, because something better ought to be there in its place.